family and faith. I've been doing a, a series on family, looking at the stories uh, that we get out of the Bible from Abraham or Abram. And I go back and forth. I'm not always strictly following the, the name transition that he goes through in the Bible, so you'll, you'll hear both. But um, we're progressing into a, another chapter of the book of Genesis, and I look forward to uh, uh, journeying with you today in uh, a little bit more of a different uh, story than we've been reading previously. To begin, though, I want to remind us of what Paul tells us in Galatians. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to promise. The New Testament acknowledges the role and the faith of Abraham being so symbolic and significant that we should not look at these stories as simply remote uh, illustrations or symbols uh, that don't directly apply to us. We are called children of Abraham. How many of you grew up in, in church, whether Sunday school or Sabbath school, singing Father Abraham? Remember, Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them, and so are you. Which is very interesting. When I became a Seventh-day Adventist, and you know, when you, when you start keeping the Sabbath, you get accused of being too Jewish, right? If you've, any of you who have joined the church or, or, or experienced kind of how some people, you're now becoming too Jewish. You're, you're, you're accepting Jewish things, and we, don't, we no longer do that. We're not bound uh, by that, that idea of the house of Israel. And um, uh, it didn't dawn on me till later, but, but you're the one that had me as a little tyke singing Father Abraham, well, if, if, I'm, if he's my father and I am one of them and so are you, that's, that means something, doesn't it? Well, anyways, that's a topic for another time. If you belong to Christ, then you are a descendant by faith of Abraham and you are now a recipient of the promises of Abraham. So what are those promises? What are we heirs of? What does it mean to be a descendant of of Abraham. Well, of course, there's a lot of directions we can go with that. Now, whenever we have the uh, um, children's church, I switch my kids' quiz, and it becomes teen trivia. So, uh, we have a few young people here, and if I, Mark, could I task you to, to be a friend here? Go with the red and the black. Uh, is there another? It, it, oh, you're right. It, that was planned. Thank you. Look at these. Th this is true elder leadership. I love this. I love to have the, the young people. Just indulge me if you will. I would appreciate your help. If you are a young person here, let's get into the story a little bit. Abraham is called the father of the faithful. Why? Is it because he never lied? Is it because he obeyed God and went to Canaan? Is it because he rescued Lot? Or is it because he offered up Isaac? Any assistance with that? Come on, teens. I'm leaning on you, young people. Let's get the story moving along. All right, I see a young person over here, not quite, but uh, yes, Chris, Kristen, Chris, Kristen, Kristen. Oh, is the black one working? Let's. Would you? I'm sorry. Would you say it one more? One, two. Oh, there you go. It's D. 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 It's actually there's two answers there, um, and and there's probably multiple other ways, but. The Bible says in Hebrews, Abraham is acknowledged and praised for two acts of faithfulness. He was called, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going to the place to which he was to receive an inheritance, and by faith he dwelt in that inheritance. So he, that, that was an act of faith. And then secondly, by faith, uh, he was, uh, uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. The interesting thing about those two events is one is kind of the beginning of the story of Abraham, and the other is kind of toward the end. There's about a 45-year period between those two acts. Did you know that? A lot happens in between. And not everything that we read about with Abram is necessarily a great example of faith. But these are the two things. He obeyed the Lord by leaving the land of the Chaldeans, and he did uh, when God called him, offered up Isaac. We're going to look at uh, a portion of that a little later. After rescuing Lot, who did Abram pay tithe to? Was it a guy named Abimelech? Is it Balaam, Laban, or Melchizedek? If you've been um, 
in the adult quarterly, we've been looking at stewardship, and we talked about this gentleman not too long ago. All right, I know it puts our young people in kind of a, a difficult position, but hey, we want your help here. Come on, even if you're wrong, it's all right. You can guess. Timry, you're still a teenager. All right, thank you. They're in the back. Now save us from silence. Is it D? It is. It is. Now, were you guessing or did you know? Oh, it sounded right. Uh, you know, multiple choice. There's all kinds of psychology that goes on when we choose a multiple choice. That's right. It is Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Salem. And uh, that's an interesting story. How did God show Abram how many children he would have? Did he show him the stars and the sand, seeds and grain, rocks and birds, or drops of water? Hey, I see you. You were ready to go on this one. Um, was it A? Is it because you saw the stars in the picture, or did you just know? <laughs> All right. He, he's right, though. Both stars and sand, God invites Abram to look at to say, look, this is, I got a great plan for you. You're going to have so many descendants. It's going to be like the stars, and it's going to be like the sand. Number four, Abram performs a strange ritual in Genesis 15. And this is one, I don't know, if, if you haven't read the narrative of Abram in a while, I, you may not even know what happens here too. What did he do? Did he offer up Isaac as a sacrifice? Did he walk between sacrificed animals? Did he worship at an altar of stone? Or did he receive circumcision? Which one do you think? Come on, teens. Oh, we got Timri right here. Timri is right here. Thank you, Dean Mark going to come help us out. See? That is wonderful. What an intelligent young lady. Did you look at my notes? Or did... <laughs> I don't know how, I mean, I don't know just in a vacuum if I would have remembered that. Um, it's a very unique thing. Uh, he did all of those things, uh, A through D, but in Genesis 15, he has this strange uh, ritual. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. He walks between sacrifice animals. Last question. Okay, and then you're off the hook. Finish this verse. Abram blank in the Lord, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Pretty important. What does that blank say? Abram did what? And God said, I'm counting that as righteousness. You know this verse? Any of you um, wise, elder... Uh, believing individuals who want to help out. I hear some whispering. I know you're whispering about this. I, I, it's clear to me. All right, I hear that. I hear that. But I think maybe we'll find some help over in this corner. Believe. Oh, you see? Did she get it right? Abram believed in the Lord and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Chuck, thank you. Dean Mark, thank you. Appreciate your help. Thank you to our young people, putting you on the spot a little bit. Not everyone likes to have the limelight. I get it, but it's just kind of a fun, interactive time. Now, um, we're going to spend some time in Genesis 15. But this verse, you, you've, you, if you've been in the church at all, if you've, you've grown up or you've, you've done Bible study, you're probably not totally unfamiliar with this verse. Abram believed in the Lord, and God reckoned it to him or credited, or accounted, there's different, depending on your Bible translation, as righteousness. To my knowledge, this is the only verse in the Bible that is repeated word for word four times. It's, and I listed the references. Obviously, the initial reference here in Genesis 15, and then the New Testament repeats this verse, quotes this verse, word for word, three additional times. And again, to my knowledge, no other Bible verse is repeated. Uh, themes are obviously repeated. Ideas, teachings are repeated. But this is the only verse that I'm aware of in the Bible that you can find word for word recorded four times. Now, that's just, you may think of that as trivial or just a, an anecdote or something like that. But in the plan of God, in the awareness and the inspiration of God, it should at least stand up as somewhat significant. 
Most Bible commentators and people that are, are serious about understanding the Scriptures will call Genesis 15, 6 the most important verse in the Old Testament. And in some cases, they'll say the entire Bible because the New Testament quotes it three additional times. The most important, it is the most declarative, the most clear statement about God's method of salvation. Of course, he uses, he uses a covenant language and he uses illustrations and sacrifices through the Garden of Eden and at Noah, Noah built an ark. It was a vehicle of salvation and, and God provides other models, other means, other ways of illustrating. But this is the first time very early on in the biblical narrative, we're still in the book of Genesis, where God will in such a strict and clear way say, this is the way it works. Abram believed in the Lord, and God said, that is sufficient for righteousness. Now that's a, again, we could spend a lot of time on this, but that's the chapter we're in. I just want to put that verse next to the most popular verse in the Bible, which is John 3, 16. They're not exactly the same, but you'll see that there is a, a great similarity between the two verses. Abram, it says, he believed in the Lord. God reckoned it to him as righteousness. The, the gift that Abram receives, the blessing that he gets for his belief is God gives him righteousness. God credits him righteousness. And by the way, Catholics and Protestants have very different views on this. We could get into imputed versus imparted righteousness, and we could have a fascinating conversation about what makes those different. But John 3, 16 says it in a different way, but very similar. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, there's that same element of belief, shall not perish, but have eternal life. So from the context of John, and from what Jesus tells Nicodemus, the reward for belief is eternal life. For Abram, the reward for belief is righteousness. So those are kind of set in parallel. Righteousness is what is needed for eternal life. And eternal life cannot be achieved without righteousness. So you have these two ideas kind of set in parallel. Some of these vastly significant passages, very uh, again, there's not a lot of symbolism here. There's not a lot of metaphor that we have to dig into. It's kind of just spoken straight out. And yet, as clear as these passages are, as, as what seem, seemingly simple they are, it's amazing how quickly the human mind and the human condition will confuse what these are actually saying. And of course, the great task of Christianity and of, of the Bible student is to try to make sure that we are adequately following. No, I want to go back here to John. Now, Jesus is the one speaking in John 3, 16, right? Jesus is the one speaking. Did you know that Abram knew Jesus? Did you know that Abram had a special revelation of Jesus? John tells us about that in John 8, 56. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says, your father Abram rejoiced to see my Jesus is speaking, Christ's day, and he saw it and was glad. Have you read that verse before? Ever thought about it? Jesus said God gave Abram a special revelation of the person of Jesus Christ in some way, some shape, some form. Now, Again, you can, you can look at the, the, the metaphors of this and say, well, surely Abram saw Jesus when he saw that ram caught in a thicket that, that God said, no, sacrifice the ram instead of your son. That Abram said, well, that's kind of what God is going to do. Or maybe God saw, or maybe Abram saw a, a, an image of Jesus in Melchizedek, that high priest who blessed him and who he gave the tithe to. Maybe he saw in some image or some symbolism, or maybe in, in uh, the three strangers that visited him and interceded for Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe Abram had some kind of a, a moment where he saw God. That's not what John says at all. Um, and from the Jewish perspective, they have always applied the story of Genesis 15 as a special gift that God gave Abram in a vision. And most Christian commentators will look at this verse and say, the time and place when Jesus revealed himself to Abram, was not on Mount Moriah, was not when he interceded for Sodom, was not with Melchizedek, but it was in Genesis 15 when Abram believed in the Lord and God credited him to his, as righteousness. Genesis 15 
In the previous um, uh, parts of the series, I've gone through Genesis 12 and then Genesis 13. I hate to break it to you, I'm skipping chapter 14. It's a wonderful chapter, but I have limited time because in two weeks, let's see, two weeks from now, uh, I'm going to be flying to Egypt. Yeah, my wife and I are going to Egypt and Israel and Jordan, my first time. So I'm going to come back way more righteous than I am now, holy and just in a, an impeccable condition. No. <laughs> Uh, so my first time, I'm excited to be able to go there and, and see firsthand the history and the places and the stories that we read about in the Bible. So, um, so I only have this week and next week. So this week is Genesis 15, next week is Genesis 16, and these two chapters go together hand in hand. And so I'm skipping chapter 14. There's other um, wonderful things that we will look at on another time in Genesis 14. But look at what Genesis 15 says. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, we're used to, within the biblical narrative, there's visions and dreams and stuff happening all over the place. A lot of firsts happen with Abram. He's the first person in the Bible to be called a prophet. He's the first person in the Bible to be called a Hebrew. He's the first person in the Bible who will use the word for peace, shalom. And he's also the first person in the Bible recorded to have a vision. And it's right here. It is a vision. It's not just an in inclination or impression or an inspiration. God reveals himself to Abram in, John, in Genesis 15. And the first words that he says to him are, do not fear, Abram, I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. We're going to come back to that. Let's, uh, let's set the background just a little bit if you haven't been part of the series. God calls Abram out of his land, away from his family where they had been pagans before in, in the land of the Chaldeans. He calls them to the promised land and he gives them this promise. Abram, the reason why I'm reaching out to you is because I'm doing something new on planet earth. I am doing something significant, something eternal on planet earth. It's not going to be an ark that's going to be built and then used and then rot away and disappear. It's not going to be these other things. I'm going to build in you a family. And in the context of the family, I am going to establish my plan and my illustration for salvation. And he tells Abram, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The plan of God with the family of Abram was to bring blessings to humankind. And so Abram, and that's what the plan is for our families as well. So Abram has been living in Canaan for about 10 years. By the time we get to Genesis 15, he has spent some time in Egypt and it was a total disaster. He did not bring a blessing. He brought a curse to the point they escorted him out of Egypt. They said, get out of here. We don't want you, which is a tragedy in the story of the biblical narrative. It's just like when the, uh, uh, the cities that rejected Christ he said, get out of here. Christ wanted to bring them a blessing. They didn't receive the blessing. But in Abram's situation, it was because of his own fault. He and the scheme he concocted with his wife and made that a disaster. So we looked at the family of Abram and his wife in Egypt. Lot leaves the family and moves to Sodom. The closest thing to a, a, a son that Abram has is Lot. And because of their wealth in Genesis 13, Lot leaves the family. And not only does he leave the family, he moves to a wicked city called Sodom. Then there's a regional war in Genesis 14, and Lot gets caught up in it. He gets captured. Initially, again, we're skipping through Genesis 14, but just going to summarize it real quick. Initially, Abram declared himself Switzerland in that war. He said, guys, you want to go to war, fine, but I'm not part of it. And again, he is a mighty chieftain. He's not just a little nomadic tribe. He has hundreds, if not thousands of servants and those that are bound to him. He is a notable, powerful chieftain. But he says, guys, I'm, uh, I'm declaring myself uh, absolved of your little uh, warfare. I don't want to get involved. But when he learns that Lot, his nephew, has been taken captive, he says, okay, I can't allow that to happen. I got to go rescue Lot. So he does that. He ends up uh, sending his troops out and they fight and they have the victory. He rescues Lot. And then Melchizedek, he comes out, and you have this amazing story of another true believer. And again, I mentioned this previously. Abram is not the only community in Israel that was a true believing community. There were others. And Melchizedek is an example of that. A true believer, not part of the community of Abram, but clearly identified as a, a righteous, following, believing individual of whom Abram then interacts with and Notice this in the story. This is the transition from chapter 14 to 15. We don't read a thing about Lot saying anything to Uncle Abraham. 
He just goes back to Sodom. Now you would think that Lot would be a little bit wiser after this and say, you know what? Maybe the move to Sodom wasn't the greatest thing. I got caught up in all the wickedness. I got caught up in all the warfare. And maybe I shouldn't have left the community and the family that God had put me in. Maybe Uncle Abe, what, what would you think, Uncle Abe? Could I, could I come and, and, and live with your community again? He doesn't do that. He doesn't say a thing. The next thing we read about is Lot and Sodom again. Now, we're tempted as we transition to chapter 15. There's a temptation to think Abram's just won a war. He has just been blessed by Melchizedek. He has just rescued Lot. You would think that we'd be opening up Genesis 15 with Abram being on a high note. I'm a mighty chieftain. I can defeat my enemies. I can rescue my family. But in reality, when we start Genesis 15, that's not Abram's experience at all. And I think what the Bible wants us to see, the best analogy that I can see this as, is Abram has now made himself a target in Canaan. Yes, he had the victory, but he's now declared himself to be at odds with some of the peoples that his role was to be a blessing to. In addition to that, yes, he rescued Lot, but think of it this way. It's more like a dad bailing his kid out of jail than it is a righteous, you know, kind of battle where he has a victory. He has to bail Lot out. He has to use his wealth, his influence. He has to bail. And not only does he have to bail Lot out, he has to bail out the hooligans that got Lot in jail with him. Because even the king of Sodom in Genesis 14 is rescued by Abram. Did you ever read that before? The king of Sodom is equally rescued, and he is there when Melchizedek blesses Abram. So not only does dad have to bail out Lot, he has to bail out the other wicked kings as well. So he's not feeling great about this. Okay, and, and Lot doesn't seem to be reciprocating either. Lot's just like, thanks, Uncle Abe, back to my, my, my idiot friends over here. And which, by the way, um, the, the New Testament calls Lot righteous many times. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing that the Jews look back on Lot and they say, well, he had his problems, but God was still working with him, and we believe that and trust it. But it's hard to find a good story about Lot. It's really hard. You have to kind of look at it from a different angle. So Lot goes back to Sodom, and so we begin chapter 15 not on a high note, on a low note. Abram is still childless and landless. Yes, he's wealthy, but he's got no one to give the wealth to. You know, it's, it's like being uh, 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 an, an incredibly successful salesperson in the wilderness. You've got no one to sell it to. You might have all these resources and all these good things, but you have no one to pass it on to. You have no one to benefit with you. So Abram is still childless. He still has no inheritance, and he's afraid for his future. He's afraid for his family, and he's wondering when or if God will fulfill his purposes. By the way, we sang the song Waymaker, right? Waymaker miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Those phrases are exactly what Genesis 15 is all about. It is almost an exact replica of exactly what God is going to take Abram through. He is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper. And we'll see a very dramatic example of how God is light in the darkness. So I was really amazed by that as we sing. I don't know if Leland was thinking about that when he wrote the song, but um, I think it goes hand in hand. So God has his way of working these things out. So let's, uh, let's just uh, get into Genesis 15. It's a very peculiar chapter. If you've ever read it before, there's these, these things that are very strange, but we're going to do our best. In a vision, God renews his promises to Abram. Abram's faith is commended. Abram performs a strange ritual. God reveals his plans to Abram and to Israel. Don't forget that the first generation reading these stories is the Exodus generation. Okay, Moses is the author, all right? Moses is the one recording this. And while the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness, they come to Moses at night and say, okay, Moses, tell us the next story about our old ancestor Abraham. He says, okay, this is what I got, okay? Don't forget that. God's purpose in this is not just to help us understand Abram's situation, but it's to help us understand Israel's situation after coming out of Egypt, and it's to help us in our situation today. So God reveals his plans to Abram and to Israel who was reading this. God establishes the eternal covenant with the descendants or heirs of Abram, including you 
him including me, if we belong to Christ. Okay, we're going to see how we can do getting through this. Going to go through most of the chapters. Some of it I'll go through a little faster than others, but we're going to go through uh, the, the story as it is delivered to us in Genesis 15. So after these things, after the war, after Melchizedek, after Lot has gone back to Sodom, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So Abram is not just hearing, he's seeing. He's seeing the Lord. By the way, this is very important, especially when we come to next week in Genesis 16, that Abram is given a vision. He is given a vision of seeing God. And Jesus acknowledges that in in John chapter 8 when he says, Abram rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. Don't miss that. Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. And that statement alone lets us know that Abram was fearing. Abram was not on a high note. Abram was starting to look around saying, you know what? We may have had this victory and all these good things, but this is not what I understood my plan to be, God's plan for my life to be. I don't feel secure in this situation. And the first words from God are, don't fear. I am a shield to you. and Your reward shall be very great. And that phrase shield, it's not just a, you know, there's the, the armor of God that we read about in Ephesians. <laughs> is that where the armor of God is? I forgot just now. Um, uh, and, you know, it talks about the, the, the shield of faith as, as salvation. The shield has always been an example, an illustration of God's salvation. Later on, Moses, same author, blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So when God says, I am a shield to you. He's saying, I am your salvation. I am the one who's going to save you. I'm the one that's going to plan and prepare and make you successful in this situation. So Abram begins to speak with the Lord, and this is what he says. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born of, in my house is my heir. Now, the Bible says that Abram and God were friends. Very ma- amazing. Abram is the only person in the Bible that is given that, that title or that acknowledgement that he was a friend of God. So uh, friends can talk to each other differently than people who aren't friends. But here you have Abram kind of wagging his finger in God's face just a little bit. What will you give me? You've not given me a child. You promised me that you were going to give me descendants, but you haven't given me. Did you you ever wag your finger? I hate it when people do it to me. (laughs) Uh, Some people, that's just how they do. But that's kind of what Abram is doing. It's it's kind of a, a frontal. You've given me all these blessings, but I've got no one to give it to. Lots in Sodom. Even my own nephew. And Eliezer, he's a servant. He's fine, but he's the closest thing I have to a son. But he's a servant in my house. My name will pass away, and my my inheritance is nothing. One born of my house is my heir. (coughs) Ooh, excuse me. (laughs) Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens. And I want you guys to recognize something. Whenever you fear, whenever you doubt, whenever you are confused about what God's plan for your life is, it is always a good idea to look to heaven. You understand? Looking to heaven is always a good model for understanding what God's plan is for your life. And that is literally what God has Abram do. Don't look down, look up. You're looking at this. You're looking at the earth. Where's my inheritance? Where are my descendants? I want you to look up. When you look up, you're going to see what my plan is. When you're going to look up, you're going to see that things are much grander and greater than you ever could have imagined. Don't look down, look up. He took him out and he said, look toward the heavens. Count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. How many stars are there? (laughs) <laughs> it's more than 11. Even in ancient times, they, they, they knew they were vast. Um, the physical eye can see about 5,000 stars if, you, if, if you've ever studied astronomy. So it's not uh, unlimited. Now, we know ultimately in the grandness of heaven, 
Uh, there's a lot more than that. But from the naked eye, without a telescope or without other magnification, um, there's about 5,000 identifiable stars or what would be apparent as a star like a, a faraway galaxy. But he said, so shall your descendants be. Look up and you're going to see something grander than what you thought. But according to his, oh, this is another part of looking up to heaven. Peter tells us, according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Don't look to earth, Abram, look to heaven because that is where the answers will be found. So it goes on like this, Genesis 15 and 6. You have this immortal passage, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, it's one of those parts where if you hear nothing else in a sermon like this, hear this. Before Abram proves his faith, God calls him faithful. And before God fulfills his promise to Abram, Abram believes in him. Did you hear that? Before Abram proves his faith, God calls him faithful and righteous. And before God fulfills his promise, God or Abram believes in God. That is salvation. To trust in God simply because you acknowledge that He is the Lord and will fulfill His promise. And God says, I declare your righteousness because I see a future. You may not be righteous now, but I see a future where righteousness will be in you. That is salvation. Abram has not proved his faithfulness. He believes in God's faithfulness. And God has not fulfilled his promise, but God, but Abram trusts that God will. Is that confusing? Is that hard? Has God fulfilled every promise in your life? So are you withholding your belief from him until he does? Remember, our relationship with God is a relationship. It's not a mechanism. It is based on real confidence and trust in one another. We can take a lot of time on this. We're going to touch on it as we go through the story. And he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the, Cal Ur of the Chaldeans I, to give you this land to possess it. And then Abram says this. Notice this. Oh, Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? Now, do you notice an irony here? It just said Abram believed in the Lord. And not half a breath later, he's like, well, now I'm not sure. How will I know? D does he believe in the Lord or not? No, you see that? Abram believed in the Lord, but he still has doubts. Believing in the Lord is not you believing in your own faith or you never having doubt. Believing in the Lord is trusting in His faith and His righteousness. Believing in the Lord does not absolve us from following the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind, but it's putting our ultimate trust in God's goodness, not our own. Wow, that's profound, Pastor. I'm going to have to write that down. I just, that is amazing. Guys, that's what it is. That is what it is. Abram has had nothing but challenges and problems. And when we come to chapter 16, this same Abram who believed in the Lord is going to get himself in a whole lot of trouble. And you're going to have to buckle your seatbelts for that one next week when we get there. Oh, Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? Now, I didn't put all the verses on the screen. If you've got Genesis 15, I'm just going to read this. God takes Abram through a very strange ritual that seems very different to our world today. Um, but it was not strange to the world in which Abram lived, nor was it to the Israelites who came out of Egypt. They are familiar with this, even if we're not. And I'm not going to get into all of it. We don't have time. Um, verse 9, he said, bring me a heifer 
a three-year-old, and a three-year-old goat, and a three-year-old ram, turtle dove, and a pigeon. And he brought these to him, and he cut them in two. He laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of the prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Then when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God invites Abram to go through a ritual that he was familiar with in that time, where you would take the ritualistic animals, you would slaughter them, and you would place them uh, apart, and then you would dwell within those parts. You would, it's, it's almost like vision questing. Any of you ever studied the Native American practice of vision quests? Okay, so that analogy won't work for you then, okay, if you don't know what it is. But it's where you, you uh, place yourself in a certain proximity, and you wait until God speaks to you, okay? You can read about this practice in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 34. So over a thousand years, the Jews would practice this, but we don't see a lot of it in the Bible. But they would sacrifice the animals, and then the, the person who is seeking a covenant or a relationship with God would dwell within those pieces. It says that the vultures came down, and he had to chase them away so that it wouldn't defile the sacrifice. Then he goes into a deep sleep and has terror and great darkness fall on him. Are, are, are you with me? This happened to me last week. I remember it just like it happened. No, I'm just... Strange, isn't it? The next part of the verses, though, are narrating what everything Abram did and what they meant. So let me show it this to you. He brought all the pieces together. He laid them in two, and he split them opposite. And it doesn't say directly, but by doing that, he has now placed himself between the... He's dwelling within the sacrifice. Okay? And then when God begins to narrate it, he says, God, uh, God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Abram was living between these pieces as a stranger, okay? Just as God says, they're going to go. The birds of the prey came down to the carcasses and Abram drove them away. God says, when they're dwelling in that land, they're going to be oppressed and they're going to be enslaved for 400 years. The oppression, that's what the vultures represented is those who are trying to steal the blessing, those that were trying to defile the blessing. And that's what happened in Egypt when they were enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. They were not able to manifest the blessing. And again, all throughout the Bible, birds coming is always represented someone trying to steal the blessing. You remember when in Jesus talked about the, the sower and the, the seed that fell upon the path, and it says the birds came and stole the seed? They were stealing the blessing. So all throughout, even in the book of Revelation, Um, Birds and vultures represent trying to steal the blessing. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. As God narrates it in chapter 15, he says, As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. By the way, first time the word shalom is found in the Bible is here in Genesis 15. You shall go to your fathers in peace. The deep sleep that Abram falls into is the exact same words that Adam fell asleep or when Adam was uh, put to sleep when Eve was created. Same exact phrase. A deep sleep fell on Abram while God brought Eve into the world. A deep sleep, a sleep of peaceful death. You shall go to your fathers in peace. And then it says, behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him because Abram learned that he would be buried and he would remain in darkness. It's strange. I get it. It's not the normal kind of parable or or metaphor that we get, okay? But in this ritual, God is explaining to Abram and explaining to Israel how they find themselves in the position that they are. God reveals to Abram that the fulfillment of the promises will not take place until his death and resurrection. And we're going to see that here in just a second. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. So as night falls, he has this vision of these two burning elements. The uh, um, sacrifices are consumed. All throughout the Bible, burning torches and flaming ovens are symbols of the presence of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush, yet the bush was not consumed. Uh, at, at Mount Sinai, it says the eyes of the sons of Israel uh, saw the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire. The blazing oven and the flaming torches are throughout the Bible illustrations of the presence of God. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels a burning fire, Daniel says. His eyes were like flaming torches. 
He says in Daniel chapter 10, even in the book of Revelation, when John sees a vision of Christ, he says, his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were burnished bronze that had been made to glow in a furnace. These two elements are the revelation of the presence of God in the presence of Abram, a consuming fire that comes to accept the sacrifice and to bring light to the darkness. Abram learns that he will die before all of God's eternal purposes are fulfilled. Abram sees the intense power and sacrifices of God's presence as it consumes the sacrifices. Abram is assured of God's power over death and the promise of resurrection. I'm going to try tying this together here, this strange ritual. What in the world does it have to do with family and faith anyway? When the New Testament explores and examines the life of faith in the story of Abram, it has some very interesting statements. In chapter 19 of Hebrews 11, it says that Abram considered that God is able to raise people from the dead from which he also received Isaac back as a type. In Genesis 21, God calls Abram to sacrifice his son. And Hebrews says that Abram knew God has the power of resurrection. Where did Abram get that faith? Did it just appear out of nowhere when he hears the voice of God, hey, take your son and sacrifice him on the mountain that I will show you. Okay, Lord, now I know you can raise the dead. All the way back to Genesis 15, God revealed to Abraham that he has the power over life and death. That's when Abram saw an image of Jesus Christ as the sacrifice who would die on our behalf and make our resurrection possible. Abram considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, if we've hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. The main thing that happens to Abram in the story of Genesis 15, is God gets his eyes off of this temporal world and gets Abram to consider the eternal, final, renewed world in which all of God's promises will be fulfilled. Because friends, they're not going to all be fulfilled in this life. Death still happens today, doesn't it? We still have trials. We still have brokenness. We still have pain. And if we put our hope in this life only, we will always, always come up short. God was trying to get Abram's eyes off of this temporal world and reveal to him something far beyond. A glorious world wherein dwells righteousness. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance, confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. But as it is, they desire, this is speaking still of Abram, Abram desired a better country. That is a heavenly one. Where did he get that idea? Because look at the end of chapter 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants, I will give this land. Now notice the description of the land. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, even in the glory days of conquering uh, Joshua, the borders of Israel never came close to that. Even in the wealth and glory of Solomon, the borders of Israel never came close to that. Even in the days of Jesus Christ, or in the days of the Maccabees, or in the days of uh, the Bar Kokhba, none of the borders of Israel have ever come close to this because these are not the borders of Israel on this earth. These are the, this is the renewed Garden of Eden that God is preparing for all of us in the new earth. This is a description. He's borrowing the very language of the Garden of Eden that was also bounded, bound by the boundaries of rivers. God says, I don't want you just to have this small country. I want to give you every fertile land on planet Earth. But it's not going to happen on this Earth. It's going to happen in the new Earth. That's the faith you need to have. God's plan is eternal and all-consuming. God wants to bless us beyond our expectations. God was saying, Abram, you're not going to have one child. You're so concerned about one child, I'm going to give you the the stars, children, as many as the stars. I'm not going to give you one land. I'm going to give you the whole world. 
God wants to bless you beyond your expectations, not less than that. His plan is to do more for you than you could ever dream of. God wanted to affirm His love and promises to Abram when He says, do not fear. Faith requires trust, patience, and submission. And all these things were happening in Genesis 15. Abram was called to have faith. He believed in the Lord. He had to have patience. That some of the things I'm promising to you, you may not get in this life. <coughs> Excuse me. And he had to submit to the Lord. That's what a family is. He's trying to make Abram understand his role. <coughs> Excuse me. Of what a family looks like. Notice this. Family. Family is eternal, friends. And family is all consuming. God is trying to restore not just a faith on planet Earth. He's trying to restore family. His family that was ruined by sin. God didn't want to just have Abram's faith. He wanted Abram to be someone who could extend God's family. Families bless us beyond our expectations. Family is the solution to sin. Family is what Satan destroyed. Family is what God is restoring. It's not just about you. It's about God's plan for you within the family. Families affirm their love and promises. Like what God did for Abram. I'm your father. I'll never leave nor forsake you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will bless you. Families require trust, a little bit of patience, maybe a lot of patience, and submitting to one another, not lording it over one another. It's not just about the individual faith journey of Abram. It's how God is using this as an illustration of how he's going to restore his family. Families believe in the Lord. And God reckons it as righteousness. We are in our, uni in our nuclear, in our, you know, our home families, but in a greater way, we are a family in the church. Amen? And what we do as a family makes a universal difference in this world. God wants to make our family the greatest illustration of salvation as possible so more can participate and join in the family. As wonderful and yet bizarre and interesting as Genesis 15 might be of this powerful example of how family and faith can be seen together in Genesis 15. Next week when we go into Genesis 16, we're going to see just how important grace, grace is in the family. You would think when we leave Genesis 15, we've now got this powerful patriarch of faith and courage, and he's going to go conquer all the evil and deliver the blessings. But God pairs these two stories together on purpose. As much as we as a family are a family of faith, we are also deeply in need of grace. Do you know what Genesis 16 is about? Come next week. And if you have a seatbelt, you might want to bring it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to delve into these things. Certainly, there's 
just, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. And Lord, I, I know that you have so much more you want to teach us. But God, thank you that we can look at these stories uh, as friends, that we can try to uh, uh, apply them to our lives and put them into a context that we can understand. We don't sacrifice animals anymore, and, and these things seem very obscure and bizarre. Uh, but built within them, there is a narrative and a story that we can understand how you are trying to establish a pattern of faith and hope and righteousness. So, Lord, um, continue to give us wisdom as we uh, work on these stories together. Help us, Father. And, Lord, bless this family. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.